Love alone. 
<laughs> what? Make my own fuel for less than a dollar a gallon and stop giving my money to big oil? Is that even possible? Yes, it is. Okay, okay. Uh, take a listen to this. Alcohol fuel expert and farmer David Bloom has a book. It's called Alcohol Can Be a Gas, and it shows how we can become fuel, food, and energy independent. Join the alcohol fuel revolution. Order your copy of Bloom's Guidebook today before the oligarchy, or should I say oligarchy, burns them. You have the power to be independent. Order your copy today. www.alcoholcanbeagas.com Or you can call 1-888-737-6228. That's 1-888-737-6228. Order now at alcoholcanbeagas.com. You are listening to Night Dreams Talk Radio Network, the home of Night Dreams Talk Radio, with Gary Anderson, syndicated worldwide. Paranormal Talk Radio, like you remember. Well, it is the 12th of October already. The weather here down the compound has shifted. It is now in the 60s. Last week, we were pretty close to 80. And I'll tell you what, according to all the reports with NOAA, we're going to be into a real, real cold winter. I just want to touch base on this. I've been getting a lot of emails from people saying that the show has a lot of commercials and it interrupts the guests. Now, here's the thing. If you're listening on Apple podcasts, Apple, iTunes, or iHeart, or wherever you're listening to, Spotify, all those. If you don't subscribe to that app, you're going to get hit with commercials. They're going to put commercials in. I have no control where they put it, where they place it. So if it's in the middle of one of my commercials or it's right in the middle of my interview, I have no control. And again, if you don't want all those commercials, all you have to do is subscribe to them. If you subscribe to any of those apps, then you don't get the commercials. Then you won't be interrupted with the show. And that is it. I mean, that's the, the best way to do it. Some apps are worse than others. And I'll tell you that much. Well, I'm all prepared for Halloween. I don't know about you. I got my skeleton put out in front of the house. Hopefully that deters trick-or-treaters this year. Well, in the news... Well, they have grown a human brain in a lab that learns to play video games in five minutes. That brain is more advanced than me because I have not learned to play a video game in my whole adult life. 
I don't have the patience. I mean, I could play Pong when that first came out, but anything other than that, it's just not been me. But just think about it. They have grown a brain that learns how to play games. That is really, really scary. Also in the news, in a mine in New Mexico, they found a pair of Levi jeans. Going back to 1880, that's how old the jeans were. Well, went up for auction and got $87,000 for those jeans. Now, how many of you out there know how to take care of your jeans? According to what I interviewed back about five years ago, a rep from Levi's, they said, you never supposed to wash your jeans. Never. If you want your jeans to last for a long time, what you want to do is after it gets soiled is put it in a plastic bag, put it in your freezer for a couple days and then pull it out. And then it's good to go. It freshens it. And they say, if you do that, your jeans will last five, 10 times longer than every time you wash it. So that is one. I didn't know that. See, I mean, freezers are good for something besides, you know, food. I tell you, I, I could see my wife coming home, opening up the freezer, cook dinner, and here's my jeans in a plastic bag. And she's going to really think, I'm, well, I lost it. Well, because of all the magnetic uh, fields shifting or the magnetic field shifting, now a scientist predicts it's going to be some major earthquakes coming soon in California. And you better be prepared for the big one. James, what do you think of that one? Listen, they've been waiting for the big one since 1910, I think. Oh, they had a big one. Don't you remember when all those bridges collapsed in California back about uh, 20 years ago? Well, they had that big one during the World Series, I think in 88 or something. But um, it was horrible. Yeah. So this is going to be worse. It could trigger. It could be a catalyst for a lot of earthquakes and a lot of other things to come. Um, and, and listen, they're living on a fault line, some of those people in California anyway. Oh, yeah. So do you keep your jeans in the freezer? No, no, I, I don't. I, when you were saying that, I'm thinking, no wonder. Look at the buildup of, of dirt that's protecting the material underneath. But, uh, yeah, it, it's true. I would believe that because here's the thing. They tell you if you want to get them look wear and tear, you wash them. So it makes sense. Yeah, well, Kim, you're right. It could smell like freezer burn. I don't know. <laughs> Knowing me, I'd eat them because it would smell like ice cream. That's what I got in my freezer. But no, this this guy who works for Levi's actually said, put your jeans in a air-sealed bag and put them in the freezer. Fold them up nice, put them in there. And they'll last, you know, hey, could you imagine? You go buy a pair of jeans right now, October 12th. Okay, and you put them in the freezer. Okay, and then you wear them for whatever length. Some people I know, like somebody, will wear them for about two weeks before washing them. But, you know, I'm not talking about me either. And what, could you imagine if you then put it in the freezer for overnight or whatever? Could you imagine by the year 2035, you still have your jeans looking like new? <laughs> <laughs> they would look like new. I, I guess what you take them out of the freezer every few days and then shake them to shake all the dirt off. I don't know. It's weird, but I can see the process of how it would preserve them uh, definitely. But you know, you're putting it in there with your food too. You got to think about that. Well, it's in a sealed airtight bag. Yeah, but I'm, I'm still. It's okay, James. No, you can't put your tidy whiteies in the freezer in a bag either. Oh, come on. Yeah. Dang it. Yeah, especially with that. Uh, skid marks on the back anyway <laughs> scientists uh, are shocked because they've been studying this one black hole in a far galaxy that is 665 million light years away they notice a year ago it sucked up this one star and it just spit it out the whole complete star and that you know when when scientists been saying for years oh nothing can go into a black hole well, this makes the point that something came out of a black hole intact, <laughs> not all tore, not all stretched or anything. No, it actually get your mind out of the gutter, James. 
<laughs> what you're actually saying, it spewed it right back out. So, yeah, we had a scientist on not too long ago said it was um, not impossible or impossible. It was impossible. Anything goes in the black hole and doesn't come out. That's what he said. But you know what? Do we have all the one, what people on too? It says that we're not going through climate changes. Oh uh, yeah, uh, it, <laughs> well, I tell you, there is no gray area with these scientists. They're they're either for or against it, and and boy, they're they vehemently uh, stand up for their their views too. Let me tell you. Well, whatever you know, it's, it's their <laughs> views. I I don't agree with it, but you know, I'm a talk show host, so you know, I, and you know how hard it is. You have to bribe everybody to come on the store, uh, the show, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I'm going bro private. Yeah, that. you're getting them a bag of gummy worms to come on. Just, I only give them the green and yellow ones because I just can't. I just can't. Are you feeling them. okay? I don't know. Oh, I, is that the, no? I don't see any gummy worms or any candy there. Do you have it hid? I, I, I think I, I do I'm see out. it hid now. Yeah, I'm out. I do got some cashews on standby, though. Okay. <laughs> or potassios. Well, a Missouri woman was repeatedly raped for the past year and she managed to escape when the authorities found her she had a dog collar around her neck and she's admitted for the past year she's been locked into this house with a dog collar not you know not being able to leave and uh, was repeatedly raped i can't believe people could do that to somebody yeah that that's horrible and, and listen it was just a Two or three years ago, there was a guy in Cleveland that had three women for like 14 years uh, held up and had kids with him and everything. He, he kidnapped them. They were, they thought that, you know, they were missing for 14 years, Gary. Yeah. Well, Whoa. you know, get prepared. There's a couple things going on. They're talking in the next about three years. Currency will be a thing of the past. You're going to get a digital card or of some sort, and that's how you're going to have your money. I don't know if I like that because, you know, if something went down, we had a solar flare, something happened, you know, that all the information through the Internet to, you know, where you want to withdraw or use this money, how are you going to do it? How can you do it? I mean, at least with, parent, uh, you know, paper, you got something. I think we need to go to the gold and silver system again. I, I got to tell you, that that is scary because that's the that's supposedly one of the signs of the apocalypse when it starts is when you know, all one currency and get, get away with money and electronics and uh, it, that's a scary thought and I think it will cause a lot of chaos. Scary. Well, I know one thing. I wanted to go to New Zealand and live here in about two years. I am not going to do that, James, because now they have all taxes of all taxes put on anything. And this is the world's first type of tax like this. Do you realize if you have cows, you're going to be taxed on, well, I can't even say this, on cow feces. Cow pies. We call them cow, cow pies. Cow pies. How about cow, a cow shit? They're going, <laughs> to tax, they're going to tax you for that. But that is, you know, that is totally asinine. But guess what? If you have sheep, you're going to be taxed for urine that that sheep passes. Now, how are they going to sit there and measure? You know, I mean, is it like taxed every time it takes a crap or is it taxed when it pees? <laughs> or is this, okay, you got a, you got a cow, you got some sheep. So, you know, this is what we're going to charge you a year because it's polluting the, the ground and the air. What? What they're going to do, I can just see it now. They're going to have a guy with a clipboard and a little sun visor, and he's going to go in these big dairy farms, and he's going, you know, they're going to call him citizen on, on patrol, and he's going to mark down every time these sheep do their thing or the cow drops a pie, and, and you're going to get taxed on it. It's, it's that simple. Yeah. Well, you know, what are they going to be next? Every time a cow farts, which is constantly, they're going to tax cows for farting? Oh, I got to tell you something, Gary. Uh, if you ever want to get somebody who's never been to a dairy farm before, just take them to a dairy farm and let them walk down the row of the cattle because you're, you're, you're facing the business end of it and you never know when a surprise will get them. Well, you know, ever since we, you know, talked about the goat and goat's milk, because a lot of people like drinking goat's <laughs> milk, and I was watching this farmer, you know, milking these goats. And as fast as they were milking them, 
you had Cocoa Puffs coming into it at the same time. <laughs> and after I saw that, I started thinking, you know what? I don't even want to drink cow's milk because who knows what's there that you don't get to see it. That's right. And on top of that is liquid animal fat that you are drinking. <laughs> so, so, yeah, mix in some Cocoa Puffs. Hey, listen, that bowl of Cocoa Puffs looks, there's no difference. You can't tell a difference. I know we used to have one of the goats that died, Mary, uh, would come into the house. And it, Mary, her name was Mary. It was our goat. I didn't choose the name. It was my daughter who chose the name. And Mary would come in the house and sit and watch TV. And then afterwards, you had to get a nice dustpan in the broom and then sweep it all up and then mop the floor. Because yeah. it was non I never seen anything like it. It never stopped. It's just it's like it's a, a you know like a machine putting it out. Yeah, you got a bunch of little brown marbles. You can play tiddlywinks with those things. They look, no, they look like cocoa posters. That other type of you know crazy. Yeah, they do. And I, I, listen, that video. I still have flashbacks about that. That one you showed me with the, yeah, they're milking that goat. Oh my god! Oh, yeah, that was horrible, wasn't it? Well, you know, NASA with Dart really clocked that asteroid and actually the the it came back with the computer you know all that stuff the calculations that actually did move the uh, asteroids so maybe we have hope if we got a big one coming that we can deflect it and buy more time that would be nice i gotta tell you i watched that video live when they showed it. that was pretty spectacular it kind of reminded me of that uh, one of them balls they drop out of the plane, you know, that you were speaking of. But, yeah, that'd be great if we had that technology to move that. That would be fantastic. But, again, that was a smaller one like you mentioned earlier. What if we get one of these big ones, you know, that's the size of you know, a county or something? Well, the guy from InfoWars, and I'm not going to mention his name, but I hope you know who he is, James. InfoWars, who is the guy who runs InfoWars? I, I can't think of him. I know you're talking about Well, it, he got, well, a, a court uh, just awarded the the people that were suing him $965 million. Oh, boy. They might as well just throw in a few more pennies and hit a billion. Jeez, that's a fortune. Yeah. Wow. A Missouri woman goes into the gas station for the last minute thing and buys a Powerball and wins fifty thousand dollars now let me guess well she's from the carolinas because they have a way of missouri winning. missouri oh missouri that's right uh, listen those lotteries some people win those lotteries it's amazing some of them win twice gary how is that possible i know and sometimes like three or four times isn't that crazy well a guy goes to in and out burger in las vegas he goes into in and out which is not a normal you know thing the way he did it I mean, how many people go through the drive-up window in and out? Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds a day. Well, he did it kind of unique. He came in riding a camel. <laughs> uh, something tells me that's not unusual in Vegas to ride up with a drive-in with a camel, on a camel. That's, um, I get to see that. I can see it. Well, can you imagine U.S. Custom Border agents watch this guy walking kind of erratic coming in from the border so they do a search i wouldn't want to have been one of those uh, u.s border agents i'll tell you that because when they pulled his pants down he had dozens of pythons in his pants he was trying to smuggle in snakes so, pythons so so if they'd asked him if that was a snake in his pocket, he would have said, yeah, it would have been true. Yeah, oh, you want to see how big my snake is in my pocket? <laughs> Jeez. Can you imagine having those things crawl around your legs, Gary? Can you imagine if they decided to get hungry? Yeah, like the guy it, it, in Florida. Yeah, you might not be talking with a normal voice. You might be talking like Tiny Tim. Uh, yeah, because let me tell you something. They've been known to munch on Frank and Beans, and that's not very uh, pleasant. I guess not. Well, hi to Barb out there in chat. Kim out there, Metatron Power and Light. Tom, you better stay out of trouble. I heard what you did over the weekend. Uh, we have uh, a bunch of other people out there. That's cool. You know what? October 12th, National Farmer's Day. Without them, I wouldn't have my dill pickles. 
<laughs> no, you wouldn't, or you wouldn't have your goat cheese or your goat milk and all that good stuff. And I can get away with anything I want to say here tonight on the show because it's National Three Thought Day. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> That's a national day for everything. That's National Gumbo Day. You like gumbo? I do like gumbo. I do, I do. Okay, it's National Savings. You know, I went to my credit union today, and I wanted to pull out $2,500. Uh -oh. I was at the drive-up window. The lady, you know, looked at me and she goes, "You sure you want to take out twenty five hundred?" I go, "No, I want now twenty six hundred." <laughs> and she goes, "Well, would you like to have a cashier's check?" And I go, "No. The whole point is, I have money in the credit union. I want cash. I'm going to go pay a bill, and and then I'm going to go." you know, take my daughter out to lunch and go do stuff with my CPA and, and all that stuff. And I got to pay her in cash and all. Well, you sure you don't want a cashier's check? <laughs> and then, then it went so far as, well, you sure you need $2,600? Could a smaller amount work for you? At wow. this point, I'm getting, James, I am really getting flustered. And I said, look, I want 2600 and she goes, well, you sure you can't get by like with 1500 I go, no, I want 2800 now. <laughs> it took her 15 minutes to come back and give me the money. And, you I know, wish. and no. And then she goes, well, Mr. Anderson, have a good day. And <laughs> she was huffy with me. It's like her damn money. Yeah, was well, she on stock in it? She's getting a, a point per bill or per per dollar. I mean, it doesn't even make sense. What she's making big on the side. I mean, come on, that's ridiculous. I would have been like, you know what? Let's just close this account out. I'll save you the hassle of having to embarrass yourself and ask me these crazy questions in the future. Why are they do? Has anybody else out there had this problem? If so, contact me at nightdreamstalkradio at gmail dot com. That's nightdreamstockradio at gmail.com or go to the website at www.nightdreamstockradio.com. Do the fast blast thing to send me a message. I'm curious if other people are going to the banks and credit unions and they're kind of being hassled when they're trying to pull money out. Well, it's national, did I say Vermont Day? Not yet, so I take it's National Vermont Day. Yeah, it, it well, certainly. I wouldn't told you if that wasn't true. <laughs> Well, it's National Day to bring your teddy bear to work or school. Oh, boy. what I can just see it now. All the teddy bears to the side of the wall, please. That's crazy. I can't figure this one out. It says National Curves Day. Curves. Now, is that like uh, female curves or is it curves uh, like on the, on the road? I don't know. It just says National Curves Day. They need to be more specific here. Maybe it's uh, like curve, uh, throw a curveball in baseball. How's it spelled? It's spelled like curves. Well, then, yeah, could be it. It could, listen, it's one of those non ambiguous things. It could be many things. <laughs> well, it's National Emergency Nurses Day. And you know what? My hats go off to them because, you know, with COVID and all this stuff, the extra hours they worked, a lot of them even gave up their lives when COVID was at the highest point by going in and taking care of patients. Uh, it's National Fossil Day. Oh, there's a lot. Listen, there's a lot of fossils out there. Now, that one I can see happening for sure. Uh-huh. It's National Stop Bullying Day know what that means not to bully people oh bowling okay bot okay. bowling bullying with a oh. b-u-l-l -L. Do, gotcha. you know, do you know what bullying is that's different this is like when you're bullying somebody right when you're you're just being mean to somebody bullying. yeah right right well it's national take your parents to lunch day oh, okay i missed that one and it's national pull your pants down. Oh, you're making that. No, one I'm not. <laughs> Absolutely am not. Would I lie to you? No, but you never know. In your area, you might have that special day and, and you're taking advantage of it, I know. No, I'm dead dead serious. Anyway, why don't you put your pants back up? Just because it's national pants day, you know, pull your pants down. You don't have to do it, okay, James? 
uh, first I got pants on to be able to do it. Hello. <laughs> okay. He's in his underwear, but don't tell anybody. He does that quite often. Well, you know, a massive asteroid will hit Earth, like I said, in November, according to a time traveler. Now, do you believe that could actually, a time traveler would know that an earthquake is going to hit Earth and take out most of Earth in November? Well, well, allegedly they can know, but here's the thing. If he's from the future, it must not kill everybody because he's here to tell us it's going to do it. And, and these time travelers, I'm going to tell you, um, they're still coming up with them using old cameras and stuff. I've seen it today even. Really? Yes. Yeah. Well, a woman in Australia wins $25,000 from a birthday lotto ticket. I can't win anything. Do you know my son? My one son goes and buys these lotto tickets every week. And occasionally he wins like $250, a hundred. I go out and I tell my wife, go buy me $10 worth of lotto tickets. You know, buck a piece ones. I haven't yet to win anything in two years. Nothing. If I did, she probably replaces it. Ah, I figured it out. I win, she replaces it, and then she pockets it. Okay. <laughs> Maybe you've been winning all along, you just don't know. You've been getting That's what I it. just said. Yeah, I know, but I think it's been going on longer than you think. I think it's been going on a while. Oh, yeah. Well, have you done anything exciting uh, over the weekend? No, I did not. Uh, actually, my yard didn't grow. I think I'm done mowing for the year, so I'm happy with that. The tomatoes will probably take down this week, and they're still growing, but they, they've been frosting every night, so they're about to die anyway. But uh, nope, uh, nothing going on. Might go to a little um, Bigfoot talk this weekend, on Saturday maybe. We'll see. Yeah, you can tell everybody about that one in Amish country that you saw next to a tree. Oh, my goodness. I still have nightmares about that. I don't know what the heck that was. I got to ask you a question. When you saw that, when you were taking a whiz out there, did you pee down your leg? <laughs> no, I didn't. I just, uh, we just all got in the car and left like real fast. Okay. So where you have the candy hit in your studio? I have yet I to, I got... I've yet to see you, not where you ha haven't had food going. I've got pistachios down below out of sight. That's all I've got tonight. Okay. That's not going to cause uh, gout or anything, is it? No, no, it's good. It's good. You know, I saw on TikTok a guy got gout and not on his toe. Oh, yeah, you can get gout. My doctor got it in his elbows and all fingers. All, you can get any joint. Oh, yeah, he had it in his jaw. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, that's horrible. Jesus. Yeah. So who's our guest tomorrow? Well, our guest tomorrow is Seth Shawstack. He's been the head and, and running SETI for, oh, my goodness, since I was a young and for a long time. And he's gonna That's going to be a good show. Seth was on before. He was always a great guest. So we're going to talk about aliens and all that stuff, trying to find proof that they exist by communicating with them or receiving communications from them. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, he's always a great guest, very insightful. So he's going to tell us what's going on in the world of SETI and what's what's in the future for SETI and all that kind of good stuff. And there's a lot. They're always looking for stuff. So we're going to get updates. What's been going on? OK, we'll be back in about three minutes. You're listening to Night Dreams Talk Radio. Mark J. Seifer is an expert on the inventor Nikola Tesla and also in the field of graphology. Dr. Seifer is lectured at West Point Military Academy, Brandeis University, the United Nations, CCNY, Lucasfilm's Industrial Light and Magic, at Wardenclyffe, Long Island, Oxford University and Cambridge University in England, University of Vancouver, Canada, and at conferences in Israel, Croatia, Serbia, and elsewhere throughout the USA. He's had articles in Wired, Civilization, Psychiatric Clinics of North America, and Cerebrum. Dr. Seifer has been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Scientific American, and The Economist. He's had appearances on Coast to Coast Radio, the BBC, on NPR's To the Best of Our Knowledge, and All Things Considered. He's also appeared on American Experience, Ancient Aliens, and in the five-part History Channel limited series, The Tesla Files. His books include fiction such as Rasputin's Nephew, Doppelganger, Crystal Knight, and Fateline.
and nonfiction like Transcending the Speed of Light, Where Does Mind End? Framed, The Definitive Book of Handwriting Analysis, and The Biography Wizard, The Life and Times of Nikola Tesla. Called A Serious Piece of Scholarship by Scientific American, Revelatory by Publishers Weekly, and A Masterpiece by a Best-Selling Author. within me tells me don't go home So I run until my feet give out I jump a little higher to clear the ground Every shadow of every girl Every time I turn around I swear it's her Second guess my every move I hold my breath in case I run in you Oh, I just can't look I can't bear the thought of seeing you With someone new Oh, I swear I'm almost over you And sometimes I find I switch off and I start to drive the Streets that no longer are my own I keep driving your way home Live across the park from me In a place that steals a tiptoe view of the sea Your sister came back home to stay The day I packed my bags and went away With a stranger and a traveler who both welcomed me I try and remember my new way home But habit sometimes steers me down your road Oh, I just can't look I can't bear the thought of seeing you With someone new Oh, I swear I'm almost old Sometimes I find I switch off and I start to drive the streets that no longer are my own. I keep driving your way home. And the day breaks slowly, and I know I can't be this lonely. Can bear the thought of seeing you with someone new. Oh, I swear I'm almost over you. Paul Wallace is the internationally best selling author of a unique trilogy Escaping from Eden, The Scars of Eden, and Echoes of Eden. Eric von Daniken says, Paul is a brilliant author of books with a way of speaking that everyone can understand. How do the world's ancestral natives and the Bible relate to ET contact in the distant past and in the world today? From Senate briefings in Washington to mysterious phenomena in ancient Greece, Iraq, and Brazil, the Eden series will take you on a journey around the globe. Discover why military and government agencies are so interested in practices of indigenous initiation and why you should be too. According to George Nouri, Paul has done it again with his Eden series, this generation's chariots of the gods. Escaping from Eden, The Scars of Eden, and Echoes of Eden by Paul Wallace. Available on Amazon and wherever books are sold. Plus, Escaping from Eden is now available as an audiobook on all major platforms. All right. Night Dreams Talk Radio would like to say a big thank you for listening to Gary and his guest. 
Gary brings back paranormal talk radio like you remember. And we are back with Mark. How are you doing tonight, my friend? I'm doing great. How are you guys? I'm surviving. And you know what? With everything that's going on worldwide, with the solar flares, the war in Ukraine, you know, North Korea, you know, the weather, I don't know. I'm I'm happy, I guess. (laughs) That's good. Based on what you said, we got to keep our chin up in those kinds of situations. What made you write a book and and do this research on this gentleman who has been underrated for all his inventions? I mean, let's face it. I mean, and I think there's so much more that he invented that we're being kept from. I don't know how you feel with Tesla, but I think that they have not disclosed everything that he ever invented. I think you're exactly right. I mean, I've been studying him for over 40 years, and I keep learning more and more about him. I think the way I got interested in him was, you know, I learned all the way back in 1976 that there was a fellow who had invented uh, the remote control, fluorescent lighting, uh, the hydroelectric power system, the induction motor, um, and wireless communication, and the basics of cell phone technology. And I couldn't believe that one guy could have done all of this. And when I started to do research and got a book of his patents, I realized this is the real deal. And so I made him the subject of my doctoral dissertation as to why Tesla's name disappeared. And then that morphed into the book, Wizard, the Life and Times of Nikola Tesla. And that book's been out about 25 years. And then I was on this television show, The Tesla Files, and people literally from all over the world were sending me information. For instance, there was a guy from the Soviet Union who was sending me declassified stuff from the Soviet Union. And I found out Tesla was negotiating with Joseph Stalin for the sale of his particle beam weapon. And um, that's the base, some of the basis of the new book, uh, Tesla Wizard at War. So that's part of how I got interested in it. Oh, yeah. Can you tell the audience, can you t- regress Tesla to when he was a child? Uh, did you do research what type of child he was and what type of family he grew up and where and, and how he got interested in science? Yeah, Tesla uh, was born in 1856 in Smiljan, Croatia. So it's about 150 miles from Rome as the crow flies, but but that's, of course, the Adriatic Sea. I've been to Smiljan. It's in the middle of nowhere. You have to go up this huge mountain, and he lives along a long plain, and way off in the distance is the Alps. His father was a a Greek Orthodox priest, and his mother was related to the regional bishop. She she was actually higher up on the hierarchy than his father, and he had a brother, too, uh, Dane, and three sisters. And Tesla had eidetic imagery. He could envision, uh, at that time, he couldn't tell the difference between his imagination and reality when he was a child. And he also was involved in traveling clairvoyance. He, you know, remote viewing. He would travel around with his mind to different places. Um, And he was inventing even as a child. He had a water wheel by the the river there. there Well, it was a stream, really. Um, He had a pop gun, which plays a big role later because it's similar to the particle beam weapon, and he lived on a farm. There was uh, pigeons and geese, and uh, and there was, uh, the, the, the parents had an Arabian steed, and his brother, Dane, was um, seven years older. So he was, when he was five years old, Dane was 12, and Dane died in an accident with this horse. But I, to add to the complexity of his childhood, the horse had saved the father's life, and the father fell off the horse, and the horse scared away a wolf. So he had this complicated situation where a horse who, one way or another, was involved with the death of his brother also saved his father's life. Um, and, and that's some of, you know, his background when he was a kid. That was, you know, 1856, the 1860s. He had cholera. Uh, he had different malaria. He caught diseases. And his father wanted him to be a priest. And he said, you know, I can get better if you let me be an electric, electrical engineer. <laughs> so the father gave in, and that's how he got involved, you know, going to college and studying mathematics and electrical engineering way back in the 1870s. Well, you know, the whole thing is, you know, I was a licensed amateur at 12 years old. And, you know, my dad was an electronic engineer. And, you know, it always amazes me, you know, when you hear about Edison, you know, and other, you know, inventing the wireless radio, inventing the telephone 
But Tesla actually didn't get credit for it. And he was, I think he had the, the one, the wireless perfected even before Kakoni or whatever his name was. And, uh, you know, the telephone. I think he already had a phone working, didn't he? He definitely did. You know, we share a lot in, in common, Gary. My father was an electrical engineer, too. He sold televisions in the 1950s. He built them from scratch. And I would go around with him and put the aerials up on the, on the uh, houses. In those days, you know, TV came through the airwaves. And uh, so when I was a kid for, for Boy Scouts, I built a crystal radio set with my dad. And there's no wires attached, you know, and you don't plug it in, but it's got a headset and it actually has a crystal and has a dial that I made out of wire that I wrapped around and it didn't work. My father's, you know, running around the upstairs. We have an aerial out the window. I can't figure this out. Oh yeah. He He connects another wire to the radiator for the ground connection. And it came in. I listened to Muhammad Ali. I listened to the Cassius Clay, you know, when he fought, uh, Sonny Liston on my uh, crystal radio set as a kid. Um, So when I was a kid, I learned that the earth was very important for picking up of wireless uh, information. And that was the basic difference between Tesla's invention of radio and Marconi. Marconi was sending it just through the airwaves, and Tesla was sending it through the earth. Uh, And that was the biggest difference uh, between them. But Tesla also invented what's known as continuous wave frequencies, we call them Hertzian waves, but they're really Tesla waves. And Marconi was just sending dots and dashes, Morse code. So the real inventor of the radio is, is Tesla, but Marconi is the real guy who brought it to the world, but he had to pilot Tesla's invention uh, you know, to, to bring it out to the world. So that's some of my background when I was a kid. I didn't know it was Tesla's invention at the time. I only learned about it when I was in my 20s. Oh, yeah. You know, when I was a kid, too, you know, my dad gave me the wire. He gave me the toilet paper roll. He got a cat's ear, which was a crystal. Okay. And a diode. And he said, go make yourself uh, in a little, uh, 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 what they call a trimmer uh, for, you know, changing the frequencies. Now, there was different ways you could do it. You could have actually moved a little lever over the windings of the coil but it was really cool. I built the thing. I, you know, I, like you, I didn't hear anything, but my dad says, well, hey, look, there's a chain link fi- fence. Hook up the ground wire to that. And boy, did I, <laughs> I heard stuff like you wouldn't believe. And it did no, no batteries, no electricity. There it was. And it was fun. Yeah, it was drawing all the energy from, from, the, from the airway. It, we're so similar, guy. I can't believe it. I didn't have a toilet roll. I, I had a, a beer can. Which I, no, I had a bottle. I had a bottle which I used, and I wrapped wire around it and uh, used acid to eat away one little area. And a beer can I used as the dial. I had to cut out a piece of the beer can, and different parts of the wire would be, be the different channels. But everything you said, that's exactly what I did. Uh, and, and I think kids today should, should build crystal radio sets because it's, it's just so neat. You learn all different way to look at the world. Oh, yeah. But then it's that is free energy to receive those signals. And, you know, a friend of mine who's no longer with us, Art Bell, he was an yeah. avid amateur radio operator. I, you know, when my license around when I was 19, I got out of, you know, you know, amateur radio and I went into commercial radio. And, you know, but my friend Art Bell had a massive amount of antenna arrays on his property, on his compound. And it was one day he got a big, huge spark. So he started measuring the foliage coming off of from the ground with these antennas. And, you know, the, the amount of electricity, the current coming off of it was shocking. Coming huh. from the ground. Where did Art grow up? Where, where did Art grow up? Uh, boy, I, I, boy, I don't know where he uh, grew up. I know where he lived for many, many years was Pahrump, Nevada, which I'd go up there and see him. Uh-huh. Yeah, I only spoke to him once. He called me uh, about Tesla. And, you know, I told him some of the ideas, and he said to me, you're not, you're not controversial enough. We need some really far-out stuff. You know? So I didn't end up on his show, but I, I did end up on, on Coast to Coast with, with George Norrie. Uh, but he was a great guy, Art Bell. He, was, he had one super show, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. And, you know, nowadays you go on to the Internet and there's literally thousands and tens of thousands of people like me trying to imitate Art Bell. But, you know, I've been doing this now 
49 years in broadcasting. Amazing. It's just amazing. Yeah, boy, I'm amazing. old. But yeah, you, you think I had my 50th high, high school reunion a few years ago. It's just, and, and you know, you, you with your friends, and it's like, you know, you snap your fingers, and it's 50 years went by, you know. Well, that it's tells amazing. me the older you get, yeah. time goes faster. It really does. Because do you remember when you were in grade school? You were in second grade and you wanted to be in third grade and the year would take so long or you couldn't wait for Christmas. And it seemed like it was forever. Every day you go up to mom and say, when's Christmas? Well, you got another 360 days to go. It was in, you know, forever. But now when you get like in your 60s, like a year is like a month. It just goes zip. I know. I'll tell you one weird thing, though. If you really want time to stand still and just crawl along, go to the DMV sometime. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you'd be there for all day, I'll tell you that. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? Oh, yeah. How, how strange time is. But, but you that's know, the thing about the mind. The mind transcends time. The mind, you know, our body gets older, but the mind can travel, you know, faster than the speed of light. It's living in a, in a tachyonic realm. Uh, now, going back to Tesla, you know, he wanted to give free energy to everybody. He felt it should be free. And, you know, he got funding from, if I remember, was it GE, the head of GE? Or Westinghouse? Well, no, it was, J well, it was J.P. Morgan, who was funding, actually, General Electric. Morgan was the richest, most powerful man in the world. And uh, this was in 1901. Morgan controlled every... Uh, industry you can think of, you know, uh, the trains, uh, uh, shipping, uh, banking, you know, insurance, uh, anything you could think of, electricity, telephone, he controlled everything. And Tesla, you know, he was, they were racing against Marconi and Tesla said, I can send the impulses to, uh, you know, to Europe. Uh, and, uh, and Morgan would travel to Europe all the time. And he'd say, can I, you know, catch up on, on the stock market if I'm in England? He said, sure. You know, there's no, no no doubt about it. But once Tesla found out that Marconi was pirating his apparatus, Tesla doubled the size of the wireless tower that he built with Morgan. So when Morgan returned and Tesla asked for more money, Tesla had essentially breached the contract. And, and Tesla was, and Morgan saying, you know, we had an agreement for a 90-foot 90, 90 tower. You're building a 180-foot tower. And Tesla said, I know. I said, but if you double the size of the tower, not only will I be able to send impulses to Europe, I'll be able to send them to China or Australia, all over the world, and we'll, and the revenues will come in so much greater. And Morgan says, "How are we going to build them?" And and Tesla said, "The money will come in differently. It'll come in on the sale of the equipment." Um, and of course, we now know that wireless communication, radio and television, has generated hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars. I mean, look at the football players today. The average football player could be making forty or fifty million dollars. You know, you know, a lineman. Uh, and it's all linked to wireless communication. So when Tesla was telling Morgan the money will come in in a different way, Morgan couldn't envision the world that we're living in. So in a sense, Tesla was going to provide the energy, you know, for no money because he realized he would get the revenues in a whole different fashion. Yeah, but he wanted to be able to people to heat their houses, light their houses, all on free energy. And you know they were working on putting up the grid system and in and, and let's face it the, the the oil for you know heating the houses and all that stuff. I mean, big money was involved, and they started seeing it as a threat. At one point, they started seeing what everything he was inventing actually was becoming a threat to what they were trying to do. Am I right? Yeah, and I I found real instances of it. Uh, another instance has to do with the lighting. Tesla is the inventor of fluorescent lighting. Um, I have I have a fluorescent light over my sink, you know, in, in the kitchen. I never turn it off. It's on, it's been on for five, six, eight years. But in the old days, you know, the Edison light bulb, you had to change the bulb every six or eight months, and you burn your fingers changing the bulb because it's all heat. Tesla said, "Let's make a light that only produces light. It doesn't produce heat." And Morgan was controlling the fluorescent lighting, which he kept the lid on for 40 years. Fluorescent lighting didn't come into the 1940s, and the reason was the demand for electricity was so great. So there's a real instance that I can establish and prove where, where you know, the money people purposely kept a much better system off the market because they wanted, you know, built-in obsolescence. So that's one example of that. 
Um, and Tesla also wanted to get rid of the use of oil. Um, for instance, look at all the fuel that's going to be used to send a rocket ship to the moon. Tesla was saying, we could beam the electricity from my towers, and so airplanes could fly without fuel, cars could run without fuel, they would get the energy from these electric towers. So he was envisioning an entirely different paradigm, a whole different way of looking at the world to save the Earth you know, from uh, sapping it from oil and coal and just providing energy in an entirely different way. So, you know, you asked in the beginning, are you still learning stuff about Tesla? Well, I mean, we're still trying to catch up to that vision of getting, you know, because I mean, look at oil right now. It's, uh, the, the Arabs and the Russians are, you know, controlling the price right now, and we have to pay. Um, so it's a whole different way to look at the world. Well, you know what? It's going to go, the oil, you know, in the Middle East has always been on green, you know, backs, right? That is going yeah. to flip very shortly. What is going to happen to us when that happens? They can say, well, we're not going to take greenbacks. That is, you know, and what would that happen to our our country down the road? We, You know, we don't produce enough oil to supply our nation on a daily basis. We actually produce more oil in this country than Saudi Arabia does. But people don't realize it. But we use so much of it a day. That you know, if they, it, shut, it sh- gets shut off in the Middle East, we got a, a problem, and you know, and not just that, it's going to affect our currency. Nobody's going to want to buy our debt in this country. Well, you know, Tesla was always he was a, uh, a you know utopian dream. That was what he wanted, and he actually achieved it with the hydroelectric power system. When he put in a system with Westinghouse at Niagara Falls. You could provide electrical power all over the Northeast. You could send electricity from Niagara Falls to New York, Philadelphia, Boston, you know, uh, Hartford, all over. And uh, you know, and before that, you had all these little power stations. You had direct current. That's, this was an alternate current system. So if you wanted to light up the entire Northeast at the time, which was in the 1880s, there were 3,000 power stations. And that was only for lighting. They couldn't run you know, electrical power for, you know, unless you were right next to the source of the power. And that's why all industry was along rivers in the 1880s. And so when Tesla came along, he said, "Why, you know, why use coal when we can use the, when we can harness the wheel work of nature? That nature was going to provide the free energy, which would be a waterfall. So if you think about the hydroelectric power system, it is renewable." And it's clean energy, and it runs forever. As long as Niagara continues to fall, you have free energy provided. You know, you have to pay for the equipment and all of that, but the actual source of power. And so that's what he wanted to do. So he did achieve it with the hydroelectric power system, but he wanted to achieve it with electrical power distribution as well through wireless communication. As I said, beaming it to airplanes and beaming it to cars and that kind of thing. Well, literally what happened is the big big guys, the big guys in industry, the wealthy people really put a, a clamp on, on Tesla and and really started a smear campaign at one point against him too, didn't they? Yeah, it's a very sad story because he's living in the world of Astoria and he's living with multi... They're billionaires. They were, for instance, Henry Clay Frick was living in the world of Astoria with Tesla. He, he owned a big piece of U.S. Steel, and he had gotten $60 million from Morgan in 1901. And Tesla's having lunch with Frick, and he said, you got to meet with Morgan. I need another 100000 to complete my wireless tower. So Frick meets with Morgan, and the deal doesn't go through. Now, if you're worth $60 million, $100,000 is pocket change. So Morgan is blocking Frick and blocking uh, you know, Thomas Fortune Ryan and Jacob Schiff. These are billionaires in today's dollars. That Tesla was setting up meetings with Morgan, and Morgan keeps blocking them. And it's a it's a really sad story. And I've you know, I've uncovered you know a lot of the reasons why, but ultimately it came down to changing you know one man's mind. If I could just change Morgan's mind, I could advance the world a century. That's what Tesla is saying. And Morgan just wouldn't yield. He he just would block Tesla over and over again. Incredibly sad story, and it prevented the radio from being invented and cell phone uh, technology from being invented in the in the early 1900s when it was developed slowly over time. Even now, you know, cell phones just came in 
pretty recently for us in the 1990s. I remember when we had large ones the size of the 16 ounce beer cans, you know. Oh, yeah. I remember my first cell phone was in a, like a briefcase. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, mine was in a car. I mean, Matt, you needed a car. Oh, yeah. And phone. and unfortunately, if somebody would call you or you're driving, right, and you were talking on the handset with your 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 cell phone, right, you go around a corner and you almost get an accident because the cord would wrap around your steering wheel. Did you, did you ever have any of those? <laughs> well, I think of Tesla himself. He's in 1904. He's pleading with Morgan. He writes a huge article, and he said, I want to convert the world into a brain, as it were, which will feel in all its parts. He's talking about a world communication system. But that insight to conceive of the world itself as a brain which can feel in all its parts, he was hoping to get, you know, uh, uh, you know, freedom and, and uh, just communi- community between all peoples of the earth through his world wireless system. And that's why he's pleading with Morgan, please give me the money to complete this. I'm going to advance the world a century. And I think strongly that if we had gotten cell phone technology in 1901, 19, 1910, you know, that range, I don't think people like Adolf Hitler could have ever rose to the, to the powers that they rose to because the world communication system. Look what's happening in Russia right now. All the, uh, all the, the men are fleeing Russia because of mass communication. They know what's going on <clears throat> in, in Ukraine. They don't want to fight that war. So they're leaving in droves. And so that's the world that we would have had a world communication system much more quickly if Tesla could have changed the mind of one single individual. That's the sad story uh, uh, behind it, you know, the history of wireless. Well, we probably would have had computers and electronics solid state a lot sooner than we did because it would have caused other people to advance as he was so far advanced. What were some of the things he invented that you can share with the uh, listeners? In, in 1898, he showed a, a remote control robotic boat. Uh, it was by wireless. People thought there was a little man inside the boat. It was in Madison Square Garden. But no one could uh, imagine that you could send a signal, you know, of 30 or 50 feet and tell a boat to move, make a left turn or a right turn or turn the lights on or whatever. What's so amazing about this remote control robotic boat is he said it had a mind of its own. I'm, I'm st- it's, it's the first prototype of another species on the planet, not made out of wires and steel, or not made out of flesh and bones, but made out of wires and steel. And I'm going to give it my own mind. Now, what I learned in, in, in the new book, you know, Tesla Wizard at War, was how he steered the boat. The boat had a counter spring on the rudder. So when the, so when the electricity was on, the boat was in one direction, and when you turned off the electricity, the counter spring kicked into gear, and the, and, and the rudder moved in the other direction. So he steered the boat with an on-off system, which is a binary code. So arguably, he's the first inventor of the logic gate, of, of the basis of computer chips, which are, you know, a binary system. So that's his genius. But imagine steering a boat by just having an on-off system. Um, that's how Tesla thought. And really, I think he is, you know, an early inventor of one of the first computers. Well, you know, again, too, big business, you know, they were out after him. I mean, literally trying to discredit him, you know, for many, many years. I mean, he pretty much died a recruits, you know, because of what he went through. Am I correct on that one? I used to think that in my new book, I found there's a whole different story here. That's what, when they were going to take down the tower in 1915, he, had, he, had, he owed $20,000 to the Waldorf Astoria in back rent. We transferred the property to uh, the Waldorf Astoria, and uh, he, he said, I'll, I'll get the money and I'll pay you back. And meanwhile, the Waldorf is going to destroy the tower and sell, sell it to salvage to try and recoup some of their losses. So Tesla reveals for the first time in 1915 that he has a particle beam weapon, but the tower could also be used to, to shoot down enemy planes as during World War One, or ships that come in. Now when World War II was on the horizon, he's negotiating with Joseph Stalin to sell the part of the beam weapon to, to Stalin, uh, which he sees as a mechanism, as a defensive mechanism. So he sees it, it's called a death ray, but he calls it a peace ray, because he felt that if every country had it, uh, then, uh, then there would be no war because you'd be nuts 
to invade another country. So what I discovered in the new book is that when Tesla was negotiating with the British War Office, the, the, one of the generals there, General L, said, let me give this to General McNaughton and, and see what he thinks. And I'm saying to myself, who the heck is General McNaughton? Never heard of the guy. It turns out he's on the cover of Time magazine. He's on the cover of Life magazine. He's flying in on a regular basis to meet with President Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, and Van Eva Bush, who's the head of the Manhattan Project. And McNaughton is the head of secret weapons development for Canada, for the Canadian government. He, if you Google his name, you'll see pictures of him with Churchill. He was third in line to be uh, the head of Allied forces behind Eisenhower and Mountbatten. The gay Eisenhower was the head of Allied forces, but that's how big McNaughton was. So as Tesla was moving into the old age, when we think of him as this old man just feeding the pigeons, he's negotiating with Joseph Stalin. He's negotiating with General McNaughton. He's negotiating with Franklin Roosevelt. I found a letter signed by Franklin Roosevelt wanting to meet with Tesla in January of 1943. It was one week before Tesla died. But the reason why Roosevelt wants to meet with Tesla is because Van Eva Bush, the head of the Manhattan Project, comes in. He says, we think the Germans are ahead of us in uh, the atom bomb. They may have built the, built the bomb before we do. And so Roosevelt says, well, what about Tesla's death ray? If we got the death ray, maybe we can protect ourselves in case the, the Germans fly the fly the bomb in to try and bomb New York City. So it's a whole different view of Tesla. So on the outside, we see this old man withering away, but on the inside, he's still right in the game, negotiating with the very highest echelons of power in, in uh, you know, as World War II uh, and the on, onset of World War II and even during the beginning of the World War II. Uh, and that's what, you know, Tesla Wizard at War is really dealing with, a whole different view of what was really going on which had never been known before. Uh, you know, I did all this research. Wow, Mark. We need to take a break. It's about three and a half minutes long. We'll come back with Mark and kind of finish up about Tesla. And, you know, it's rather interesting, all his life, what he went through. The guy literally died with no money or anything. We'll be back with Mark, so stay tuned. You're listening to Night Dreams Talk Radio.
listening to Night Dreams Talk Radio Network, the home of Night Dreams Talk Radio, with Gary Anderson, syndicated worldwide. Paranormal Talk Radio, like you remember. And we are back with Mark. The death ray, what was that actually? Do you, do you know anything about what he was trying to create with the death ray? And did they ever test it out and did it work? You're asking a great question. Uh, and that's a lot of what Wizard at War is all about, is, is selling the death ray to the Allied forces. Uh, Germany wanted it too. And, and uh, they probably broke into his place, his you know, theories that he was murdered by the Germans and the Nazis. Uh, the Nazis killed 90,000 Serbs uh, during World War II, and Tesla was, of course, a, a Serb. Uh, but the death ray was, but Tesla realized, if you take a flashlight and shine it you know, out, it loses all its power because you know, it, it, it spreads out you know, at, 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 uh, and loses all its power. And Tesla realized if I send a beam of anything like a death ray, if I send out a, a, an impulse of electricity, it will lose all its power over distance. So how can I concentrate that energy? So we came up with the idea of a particle beam weapon. But what the particle beam weapon is, he has an open-ended vacuum tube, and he has a belt like a Van de Graaff generator, but it's a belt of electrical ions negatively charged. And he cuts off tiny little microscopic pieces of tungsten, also negatively charged, and it, that will shoot out the barrel of a gun at like 300 miles a second. And so... That's basically what it was. So it's called a particle beam weapon. Now, did they ever test it? I know uh, one fellow who worked for DARPA. He's a, a, an expert on Tesla, and he was hired by DARPA in the 1990s to try and uh, build the particle beam weapon. I believe that the railgun, which is used by the Navy right now, which is a major weapon that, the, that we're using right now to shoot down, you know, uh, rockets and that kind of thing, you know, that would come in. Uh, is based on the exact same principle. So I think that Tesla's particle beam weapon, which is this top secret paper, uh, you know, you, I know paranormal is one of your top uh, topics. Well, Andrea Kuharich, the guy who brought Eric Gell to the, to the world, unveiled the secret particle beam weapon paper in 1984 at the Tesla conference in Colorado Springs, where I spoke and, and, and on, I was good friends with Kuharich. And so I studied the particle beam weapon paper. And I think the principles of that, that using a repellent force to, to shoot out particles, is the basis of the railgun. So I think today's U.S. Navy railgun is actually a, uh, a, uh, a grandson of the, you know, of the particle beam weapon conceived of by Tesla. Whatever happened, you know, here he was, he dies, and according to what I've researched, in the past that, you know, the FBI just swarmed into his place and confiscated every note, every anything he ever wrote down. And then it just like disappeared. I mean, that's kind of strange, isn't it? It's really strange. What happened is right after he died, the FBI confiscated everything. But Tesla had, uh, you know, relatives in Yugoslavia. One of his relatives was Sava Kasanovich who was the ambassador for Yugoslavia when Tito was you know, in power. Tito was a communist. So in theory, his estate should have gone to Kasanovich and then gone to this communist country in Yugoslavia. And the military uh, put the kibosh on that and stopped that, and they sat on his, his, uh, you know, his papers for 10 years. And what I discovered was there were two factions in the military. One faction was headed by John G. Trump, who happened to have been President Trump's uncle, uh, and uh, it was, you know, his father's brother. He studied Tesla's papers, and he said, nah, don't worry about it. We can send this over to the, to the commies. Just don't worry about it. And then there was another group headed by General L.C. Craigie, who was the first uh, military person to fly a jet plane. He was kind of a Chuck Yeager or John Glenn of his day. And he said, wait a second. I think there's a lot to this. So there was dissension between these two groups, one headed by John G. Trump, who, who was teaching at MIT, and the other by General uh, L.C. Craigie, who was at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And so Craigie won out, and the papers were kept, you know, hidden uh, and studied. And one of the things I learned was that one of the people was the head of Bell Labs. Bell Labs developed the Osprey helicopter airplane. Tesla had a patent on 
that helicopter airplane. He called it the Flipper Plane in 1921. If you Google the Osprey helicopter airplane, you're not going to find Tesla's name. So his his name has been hidden away and removed from you know the, the ideology, the beginnings of all these inventions. Um, and that's you know one of the things that I also established. And we show that in, in the, the television show, the Tesla Files, in the fourth show. Uh, we actually send two guys up into the helicopter airplane, and the guy flying the plane looks at Tesla's invention and says, yeah, I think you're right. Tesla might have been the inventor of all this. So there's two examples of where his you know, inventions have been hidden away. And the reason, of course, was the military implications of, of what he had. So the big question is, did he have other inventions? Were there other things in there that we don't know about? Um, so that's some of the you know, research I've been doing you know, in, in with it at war. Whatever happened, though, to the documents today? I mean, I mean, there are they non-existent? I mean, can you get any of the information on a free freedom of information, or it's non-existent? Yeah, I use Freedom of Information Act. I got huge uh, files from the Office of Alien Property and also from the FBI and some stuff from the CIA. But the simple fact of the matter is, after 10 years, because Tesla's estate was really owned by Kostanovich, his nephew, it was all shipped to uh, uh, Yugoslavia. I've been there uh, to the Tesla Museum in Belgrade. They have 200,000 documents. Uh, uh, you know, Tesla knew everybody, and he kept everything. He's got letters from Rudyard Kipling. He's got letters from Mark Twain, plus, you know, from uh, John Jacob Astor, uh, J.P. Morgan, um, uh, William Randolph Hearst, um, Louis Tiffany. He knew everybody. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, there, there's, you know, correspondence there. Uh, he knew Teddy Roosevelt's sister, Corrine Robinson, was one of his closest friends, was Teddy Roosevelt's uh, sister. Um, so there's 200,000 documents, a lot of, and some of the secret stuff is definitely at the Tesla Museum, which we uncovered, you know, in the, in the show, the, tel- the Tesla Files. I actually looked at the, his negotiations with the Russians uh, when, in the very first show, the Tesla Files. Um, so all that stuff uh, he kept, and it was all eventually shipped to, uh, to Yugoslavia, but the question is, did they ship everything? Did they keep anything? Uh, they certainly kept copies of, of a lot of this stuff. So that's really what happened to this day. I would think, too, because from what I read, the FBI raided it. Now, if the F- FBI raided it, you know, who knows how many of the documents they kept that, you know, went, disappeared. You know what I'm talking about? It, it's gone into the black. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, there were letters, though, between the FBI and the Office of Alien Property and uh, and Vanny Bush, you know, who was the head of the Manhattan Project, the head of secret weapons development. And they, they took it over. So in other words, the FBI didn't maintain control. The military got control over it. Um, I talked to the uh, Ralph Bergstresser, who was in the military in 1942. He was meeting with Tesla. Tesla was a very old man. And Tesla had given the details of the particle beam weapon to the U.S. military. And Bergstresser was the guy who was taking down the notes and copying it and creating microfilm. And so in 1984, this was like 40 years later, Bergstresser sat on all this for 40 years. He gave the paper to a liaison who gave it to Andrea Puharich. I'm sure you know who Puharich is. And Puharich revealed the secret paper to the world. So it's now you know available online. You can see his particle beam weapon paper. And what I do in the book is really get into uh, who he was negotiating with. Um, and again, you know, for me, the biggest find was General McNaughton, third in line to head Allied forces, Winston Churchill's right arm, head of secret weapons development for Canadian government, flying in literally meeting with Franklin Roosevelt and uh, Vanny Bush, the head of Manhattan Project, uh, and negotiating with Tesla all at the same time. The Tesla was in the game. Uh, they were really seriously thinking about using a particle beam weapon. They had to put all their resources into building the, the nuclear bomb, though, and, and that's one of the reasons why um, his weapon, you know, took many years to develop because they put all of you know the emphasis in, into the bomb instead. Very interesting. And again, what was his finances like towards the end of his life? I mean, here he had all these inventions and. And he's met with Roosevelt, and Stalin, and all these people through the years, you know, uh, some of the richest people on earth at that time. And I heard he died virtually penniless. Yeah, he really wasn't penniless. 
1934, at the height of the Depression, he got $25,000 from the Soviet Union. Now, you and I remember when you could buy a, you know, a candy bar for a nickel. A quarter was a lot of money. Remember the Standing Liberty quarters? You could get one or two when you were a kid, if you were lucky. Um, I mean, you know, money was silver in those days. You know, a you know, half dollar was made out of silver. So in, in, 19, in, the, in the height of the Depression, getting a check for $25,000, that's easily $500,000 today. Um, and he got another $1,000 for the Elliott Crescent Medal uh, from Philadelphia in, during the height of the Depression. And Yugoslavia was giving him a few thousand dollars a year. Um, so he wasn't penniless. Um, he was getting money. And he had uh, the Westinghouse Company was paying his rent uh, at the Hotel New Yorker. So it's kind of a myth that he was that he was penniless. He really wasn't. In fact, he was hallucinating the last couple of weeks of his life, giving hundred dollar bills to a a, uh, a, 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 a a you know a guy who delivered packages and say, please send me give these hundred dollar bills to Mark Twain. Mark Twain had been dead for forty years. You know, <laughs> so he was hallucinating the last few years of his life. So I think he had a lot of money tucked away. I don't think he really was penniless, but he seemed like he was because he lived, you know, a very austere life at the end of his life. But at the end, in the last six months of his life, he's working with Ralph Bergstress, who's working for military intelligence, uh, giving them the details of what he's calling a, a peace ray, but a death ray to help protect the country in case, you know, the Germans fly over an atomic bomb. That really was the real fear. And that's why President Roosevelt wanted to meet with Tesla. He wanted the details himself because, you know, I mean, whoever got the atom bomb first, forget it. That they would have won the war. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, if they have had a death ray for quite a few years. And, you know, and who knows? I mean, you know, you don't know what's going on to, you know, something major happens. And then you can find, because I really think our technology, what we think we have, like me and you, I think it's far more advanced. Well, I, you know, look at Israel. You know, the, the uh, Hamas has sent over like a thousand rockets, and Israel shoots down 97 percent of them. And even today in the, the Ukraine, I think Russia sent over like 80 rockets. They shot down more than more than half of them. Um, and that's basically, you know, the Star Wars. One of the things I discovered in, in Wizard at War was Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, when he was an actor in 1940 was in a movie called Murder in the Air, which was about the death ring. It was about Tesla, you know, as it's fictionalizing Tesla's death ring. And Reagan, when he became president, funded Star Wars technology, which is exactly this whole concept. What, what Tesla wanted to do was create these rays, which would protect us from, from invasion. So I even am able to tie, you know, uh, President Reagan uh, back to Tesla, because when he was a youngster, you know, uh, in films with Her Errol Flynn and, and those kind of movies, he was a hero in this movie about a death ray, murder in the air. It's called. You can Google it. You'll see like the promo for it. That's uh, well, not really neat. Yeah, even if you go back for the remember the old serials and stuff like that. Uh, that even all those serials of the twenties and thirties, they had death rays. Yeah, all of that it was fictionalizing Tesla. The whole idea of the mad scientist that was Tesla, and and in fact. Hugo Gernsback, who had amazing stories and amazing wonder stories, was a good friend of Tesla's. Um, you know, he's the, the father of science fiction. The Hugo Award is named after Hugo Gernsback. And he helped uh, get the Westinghouse Company to pay the rent for Tesla because Westinghouse Broadcasting was based on Tesla's wireless system. And Tesla would go in and say, hey, I gave you all this at the turn of the century, and you turned it down now in the 1920s. You're using my stuff, and you're not paying me for it. And so Gernsback, you know, the father of science fiction, was able to talk the Westinghouse company into saying, you know, you really owe this guy. Pay, at least pay his rent at the Hotel New Yorker. So what you're saying, that, that all those serials, they go back to Hugo Gernsback, and, and Hugo Gernsback was stimulated by Tesla's life of sending electricity to his body and all the amazing things in visual electricity. So Tesla's really, the, you know, the mad scientist, the prototype of the mad scientist. In fact, even, you know, the movie Frankenstein and then Young Frankenstein, all that equipment was based on Tesla's, uh, you know, uh, laboratory. Oh, yeah. It looks like Tesla's laboratory, you know. And, and again, I mean, the, all of the things that he created and, and it, like I said, of 
all the scientists, all the inventors, if you really think about it, he was one. It was just not really credited for what he invented. And and it, look at our technology we have today. I think if it wasn't for Tesla, we wouldn't have half the technology we have today. And people take that for granted. Yeah, the whole modern age. I'll tell you another thing he invented. He invented an ozone generator, which he was selling to uh, medical professionals. And I, I have a new book coming out on it's called uh, Ozone Therapy for the Treatment of Viruses. Ozone kills viruses. And uh, so ozone generators, he actually had the technology that could have ended this, this pandemic that we were dealing with had we used, you know, ozone generators uh, to clean the rooms and also ozone therapy where you inject mostly oxygen, a little bit of ozone into the, into the bloodstream. It killed viruses. Um, so Tesla was even in the forefront of uh, biotechnology. So, you know, we think of them as, you know, wireless communication, robots, and, and hydroelectric power system, but he's also involved in the medical field as well. It's just, his life is so fascinating. I mean, the guy really was the essence of what being a genius is all about. I heard, too, he had a lot of different assistants that it would help him, but they, they kind of didn't stay around very long. Is that true? Well, he hid the details of a lot of his stuff because he didn't want them to, to rip him off. Uh, one of his assistants, which did which did stay with him a lot, was uh, Fritz Lowenstein, who eventually began working with uh, John Hayes Hammond Jr. Um, and Hammond Jr. had a castle in uh, Gloucester, Massachusetts, near Rockport. He's one of the fathers of radio guidance systems, and he was one of Tesla's uh, uh, partners. And ha- and Hammond Jr. was good friends with Andrea Puharic. And when Puharic was working with Eileen Garrett, you know, the psychic, they would go up to the Hammond Castle and do these uh, telepathy experiments in Faraday cages to prove that telepathy was not blocked by electromagnetic grids that would block out normal electromagnetic grids. So there's this whole weird connection between uh, Andrea Puharic, Yuri Geller, uh, John Hayes Hammond Jr. and Hammond Jr.'s partner, who happened to be Nikola Tesla. So that that's why Puharic was, uh, you know, closely related to uh, the inside knowledge of who Tesla was. He helped me a lot in, in writing the first book I put together on Tesla, you know, called Wizard. You know, there's so much misinformation about Tesla, too. If you Google it, you know, I was reading a thing today that they claimed that Tesla was trying to communicate with the dead also. With this technology, <laughs> I know that Edison was trying to do that. Uh, Tesla was very pragmatic. The irony was he didn't believe in telepathy, and you would think a guy like Tesla would definitely believe in telepathy. Hammond, it was his partner, definitely believed in telepathy. You know, the last telepathy between twins and things like that. Uh, so he definitely. But what happened to him in, in 1899 when he was out in Colorado Springs? He received three pulse frequencies on his equipment, and he thought they came from Mars. So he believed that that the Martians existed. He thought that they were like a million years ahead of us, and we were catching up to them with our new modern technology, and they were contacting Tesla. So once he was uh, connected to the occult and the idea of extraterrestrials, that was another reason why his name disappeared. And so then there was a book written that he really was an extraterrestrial, and uh, the movie, you know, The Man Who Fell to Earth, uh, starring David Bowie, was really a takeoff in Tesla's life that this guy came from another planet to give us, you know, the hydroelectric power system, remote control, robotics, wireless communication. Um, and this guy, you know, his name was Tesla. That was a myth that was created around him. So that's another reason why his name disappeared um, and another reason why there's a lot of false information out about him. And that's why I have so many end notes in my books. I mean, you can look up the sources of where I, where I come from. He really is the inventor of all these things. It's not, it's not Malaki. He really is the primary inventor of wireless communication, remote control, hydroelectric power systems, fluorescent lighting, uh, and the helicopter airplane. Oh, yeah. yeah. And if he would have been a businessman, but he wasn't, he would have been one of the richest people on Earth. Just think about that. Yeah, he, he well, he ripped up the royalty clause with, uh, with Westinghouse during the War of the Kind. Was you know Edison had the name DC, uh, he had DC and Westinghouse had AC, but you know Edison was the the Wizard of Menlo Park. He invented the light bulb and, and the uh, phonograph. 
people believed in Edison, but if, had Edison succeeded at Niagara Falls, he, he couldn't even li- uh, uh, been able to light up Buffalo, which was 22 miles away, because D.C. could only travel about a mile, power dropping off over distance. So all the factories would have had to have gone up to Niagara Falls, and we, it would have ruined Niagara Falls. So thank heavens Tesla came along, Westinghouse was smart enough to be able to beat Edison in the world of currents, but during the height of it all, Tesla ripped up the royalty clause because Westinghouse said, I'm losing money here and I can't afford to pay you. And so instead of taking a deferred payment, which a smart businessman would have done, uh, Tesla didn't. He, he just ripped up the clause and that was that. And mm. it cost him you know, millions of dollars. Yeah, yeah, millions would be, be billions in today's money, I'll tell you that. Uh, how, do you have a website or anything, or author page you want to share to the listeners? Yeah, it's my name, MarkSeifer.com, M-A-R-C-S-E-I-F-E-R. And my new book is Tesla, Wizard at War, where I really get into all the things that we're talking about. He's such a fascinating guy. I'm easy to get to. I, I don't hide my email address. And you know what it's like, you know, you try to contact all these people, they hide their email address, but I don't get it. Uh, so my email address is, uh, is there, and I communicate with many people. I've worked with a lot of kids, you know, uh, seventh grade, eighth grade, even earlier than that, doing their uh, projects on Tesla, and a lot of them have won awards um, uh, for that. Um, so that that would be my website, com. And your name of your newest book? It's Tesla Wizard at War. And it's available where? It's available all over the place. Uh, Barnes & Noble has a really good review of it, five-star review. And, uh, of course, Amazon has it. And it's literally, um, you know, in, in the Barnes & Noble and in, in the bookstores. I have a book signing here in Rhode Island in Wakefield on October 29th, uh, which is a, a Saturday morning. Um, and uh, it's literally all over the place. Well, great. Hey, Mark, I want to thank you so much, my friend, for coming on. Gary, this was great. It was great speaking with you. And I, and I love the fact that you and I both had uh, these crystal radio sets as kids. I mean, that we share a lot in common because you you know what the fascination of that was. But thanks so much for having me. I, I greatly appreciate it. Okay, Mark, you have a great weekend. It's coming up. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. Well, what's, uh, James, is some of the guests we have coming up. Well, tomorrow we got Seth Shostak coming on. Going to talk about, of course, SETI and what's going on with that and what's in the future with SETI. And then Friday we're going to have Steve Starr back on talking about nukes and nuclear war and, and everything A to Z that we need to know about nukes and how we can prepare for it and, and aftermath and those kind of things. Now, Sunday on the Truckers After uh, Dark show, we're going to have Chris George coming on. And those are the the next three guests in line, Gary. Interesting. You know, people, if you go on TikTok, it's, you know, almost everybody's talking about Ukraine. They're talking about nuclear war. They're talking about it escalating. And, you know, people, you know, how can you say it? I mean, the government just spent $290 million for buying anti-radiation pills. I mean, you know, for the public, in, they give to FEMA in case something happens. I mean, you know, I, I, this is weird. This is worse than any Cold War I ever remember. Because you know what? Nowadays, the going under your table is not going to help you. I mean, you think about it. You know what was dropped in Hiroshima, okay, compared to what they have now. It's like... Oh, wow. It, it's scary. I mean, you know, instead of taking out a half a mile, you're taking out a 15, 20 mile radius. It's it's scary. And it's scary that we as civilized people are still waging war and killing and slaughtering people. And I, I'm just still com- concerned. I hope it doesn't escalate. I really hope that, you know, Putin and, you know, the... NATO and our president just really, you know, I mean, the, 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 we're playing with fire here. Oh, yeah, we're definitely closer to midnight than we've ever probably been ever before. And you're right. Uh, you're talking 75 years in advanced technology since the first one was dropped. That's a yeah, they've got nowadays way far advanced than what we could, they've had uh, 75 years ago. So, yeah, it is scary. 
Now, I just thought society would never even think about nuclear using it. And the threat of it is, is just scary. And I'll be honest with you, the politicians in the last 20 years has gotten really scary. You know that. Like I keep telling you, you could probably pull a bum off a of skid row and make him president. And they would probably make a better decision. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like you say, if that's why the you know so-called ETs doesn't they don't go on the um, White House lawn, especially if they're reading brains of politicians. Yeah, they'll starve to death. Well, again, tomorrow we got Seth on from SETI. We're going to talk about, well, you know, looking for radio signals from out there. You know, occasionally they do find the signals, but then they trace it down to not alien life. But then I was reading here last week. Again, there's some more signals coming out that think it could be from advanced civilization out there. Oh, yeah, there's there's um, several instances, you know, when those come across, they pick up a signal, they got to try to validate with other sources around the world. But I remember the one that came out from uh, Columbus, the wow, I think that was in 1977. And then, uh, of course, there was one a few years ago, they thought they had something and it turned out to be somebody was using a microwave. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, that happened at SETI. Yeah, somebody was eating their lunch or something. Yeah, and then they were getting these radio signals, you know, sporadic. Well, I'm going to go heat up my TV dinner, my coffee, my this. Oh, we're getting these signals. Well, anyway, till tomorrow, everybody came out there, Barb, Tom, and and everybody else out there. You have a great evening. Again, if you want to listen to more of me, you can listen to me 24-7. Just go to our website at www.nightdreamstalkradio.com. You can get your catch of Night Dreams Talk Radio there. iHeart Radio, tune in, Spotify, uh-huh, uh, speaker app, all these other apps. You can listen to us. But again, if you don't want to hear commercials, pay the five bucks a month. This is not my show. You can go on to any of those apps and then you don't hear all the commercials. So again, when you send me an email yelling at me saying that I have way too many commercials and I need to edit them out, it's not my fault. Blame it on the apps. If you pay for it, you don't have it. Okay, everybody, have a good one. We will catch you on the other side of the campground if I remember where it's at. Gonna take it for a ride in my brand new car. My brand new car. Gonna take it for a ride in my brand new car. My brand new car. Gonna show you how the ships are Tonight is the night that we make it